It depends whether or not you do chess club, right? If you do chess club, then what you do is you say, uh, we have uh, one week, five hearing days, we divide it up two and a half days each for each side. You allocate your own time the way you want. So one party may say, well, I want to do it the traditional way. I will do a short opening statement, and then I want to save all my time to cross-examine the other party's that's up to him. Um, but if you do it the other way, where the tribunal fixes um, the timetable, and they will usually ask each side, how long do you want to cross Um And then they will sort of start with a assumption of what they think would be useful uh, for opening statements. So I must say that uh, normally most tribunals uh, will vary from um, half a day for both sides to make their statements, which is roughly about one and a half hours each, uh, which I try to uh, persuade them. If I'm not chair, then I will try and persuade the chair to increase it to one full day if possible. Um, because, and, and then we you know, fix, but you, you have to explain uh, that. If, if the tribunal is going to Persuade the parties to, ex uh, to, to accept that uh, kind of formulation. Um, then they have to explain what they, what they expect to be done uh, if they give them half a day each. But half a day goes actually quite fast. Um, you know, you've got three, three hours in the morning and you've got a break um, and so on. Um, but Some uh, tribunals just say, oh, I, I want to get on. Some very old-fashioned people say, no, I want to hear the witnesses. It's too boring to listen uh, to the uh, counsel. Uh, or they'll simply say, well, you know, they've given us 100 pages of opening statements. We really uh, don't need them to elaborate anymore. And I would say, no, when you have 100 pages, you know, you, when you read the 100 pages on your own, it's not the same as, it's, that's where the skill of the, the advocate will come in. He's given everything there, but then he, he needs to go through and highlight, which is the important part. Uh, of course, he can literally have every word and read up every word of it, but uh, if you've done 100 pages, you can't even finish it in, in, in three hours, uh, especially if you want to go to each and every document. So you have to be a bit selective, uh, and that is uh, what is worth. In, in other words, I, I think the tribunal has to say, we will get, how should I put it, value added by reduction rather than addition. Um, I give you a uh, I mean, there are two aspects to it. The trouble is nearly, probably 90% of my cases are with two other colleagues. And so you have to defer to the chair. Even if I were the chair, I have to persuade my co arbitrators that they should allow us to be a bit more proactive in shaping the way that the time is used and telling them to cross-examine less and explain to us more. Um, and I sat recently in a case uh, where the chair was a civil law lawyer, uh, a lady, and um, I explained to them, you know, they are cross-examining in a very ineffective way. Uh, can we try and persuade them to cut it down? Uh, so they said, well, you try. And uh, I then 
told one of the counsel, I think your cross examination is not getting us anywhere because it's for the reasons that I just explained. And maybe you can just focus on this. Um, and the reason why I was able to do this, I, 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 why I, I picked this particular lawyer that I could tell him how to cross examine was because he used to work for me. <laughs> so, so, so he was a bit more receptive. <laughs> and then hoping that that would also give the message to the other lawyer, who was an American lawyer, a very senior, much more senior than this uh, counsel. And the American lawyer did not take the hint, and he kept on going down the line in the same old-fashioned way and not very effectively. So then, you know, I didn't want to be, I wasn't chair, so I asked the chair, would you like to tell him? He said, I agree with you, but you know, we do not want to be seen to be inhibiting or controlling counsel and preventing them from doing things the way they want, otherwise they'll complain. Every tribunal is always uh, nervous uh, of challenges on the grounds that somehow you in, uh, impeded counsel's presentation of the case, right, which affected them adversely. So it's only when I'm so arbitrated, which is quite rare, that I will be a bit more assertive. See, I, I, I give, give you another example. I had a case, it was a small case I did some years ago, but I was sold. And the lawyer for the claimant, uh, he was very anxious to get his witness on, so he, he had a very short opening. He said, look, I don't understand the opening. Please stay. Explain to me more. Explain to me more. He says, but you know, the witness is waiting. Says, Never mind about the witness. I want you to explain to me. Because uh, the witness might not know what uh, he was supposed to explain. So after about one day of long discussions with the, the lawyer and going through the documents, then on the second day morning, I said, look, I finally understand you know, what your case is, where the dispute is. Now you can call your witness because I only want to ask you questions about this. And he came, it was a very short uh, cross-examination in the course. It was actually a, more an examination by me and then a cross-examination. Um, and I think the way that I try and persuade counsel to let me uh, shape timing uh, and the way that they cross-examine is, is to say, and they, I mean this genuinely, I said, no, honestly, I think I will get more help from you as counsel than your witnesses. Because you know the whole case. They only know that part of the case. Um, of course, you know, it, you are the conductors of the orchestra. So, you know, you can tell uh, the, the, this is the part that the violin plays, this is the part that the flute will come in. Uh, but you know the whole story, so we want to know the story and where things fit in you know, to the score, if you use the musical analogy further. Um, and I think really that I will get more assistance from counsel. So if, if they, you can boost the ego, make them feel more uh, important, I hope that works well for both parties. Because it's true. That's why I say if the lawyer will concentrate on the opening statement more, um, then it just becomes a dialogue. Until we get to the point, okay, now we have identified the real areas uh, of disagreement, then you are, you are set for the cross-examination. And then maybe not every witness will come, and certainly some witnesses will be shorter than uh, what they thought would be originally. Yes, sorry, Rob. Uh, Robert Walker, just curious your thoughts on the, the experience of time during a hearing. Because you gave the example of Monday compared to Friday. As counsel going through a hearing, a five day hearing, it sometimes feels like five weeks. So there's a concern by the time you get to the finish line on Friday, you know, will the tribunal even remember, you know, where we were midday on Monday when we finished the openings? And here in Korea, we frequently, it, it's common to have oral openings, but not as common to have the oral closings. So there's a concern, what's really in the tribunal's mind late in the day on Friday if there's not an oral closing, and if the last thing they've heard over the last four days is just cross-examination. So as an arbitrator, do you clearly remember everything that happened on Monday? <laughs> is, it, is it like counsel where that just seems like ages ago that they made those arguments? No, well, you're right. Because if there was a relatively short opening that was one hour each, and all the 
guy gives you is the headings, you know, of this submission. Oh, you'll find this on page so and so, you'll find that on page so and so. Um, then you may not remember. And as I said, you get distracted um, disproportionately by the witnesses coming. And then one uh, counsel or the other trying to grandstand. I mean, one uh, counsel I had. It was, time was short, so we said, for this witness, we would like you to limit yourself to 20 minutes. If you, you know, we don't think it's that important, and you should be able to finish in 20 minutes. His first question is, look at this letter. Yeah, the guy looks at it, read the letter. It takes him two minutes, three minutes. Where in the letter does it say X? This is the kind of question that is absolutely useless. If it's not there, it's not there. But it took up four or five minutes of his 20 minutes. And he wanted to show that the, something that he thought should be there wasn't there. It would have taken him 30 seconds in a submission and he could have said it loudly. He said, this is very important. And we would have believed him. This, this, this is just making the witness look bad for the sake of it. It's not a good way of proceeding in that case. Sorry, was there another question? Sorry, so it is. emphasis on all these things as opposed to cross salvation is probably the best way I personally prefer. But at the same time, we also have to deal with arbitrators that tend to have a different um, school of thought, which is that in order to be a persuasive, in order for a story to be persuasive, it has to be genuine. And in order to be genuine, there has to be a face to story, a contemporaneous witness of the facts. You can um, tell it in a way that appeals to the arbitrator who might be um, hardwired to find stories for appealing. Um, and, and those, I mean, is it, is it, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do we have arbitrators that would prefer to have put face to a story? Or do you think there are more arbitrators that like logical, um, clean, but dry type of presentation because of what the, the, what the application of I think you can have an interesting way of telling the story if counsel, you know, is a good storyteller. Um, I mean, he's got the material there, and he, he will say, this story begins, you know, and so and so, where Mr. X met Mr. Y and they formed a partnership, and you'll see the reference here and there. I mean, he, he gives all the information, but he narrates it you know, in the way of the story, especially for this kind of um, case where it's a dispute about a joint venture. Um, and that, I mean, they're interesting uh, opening lines. I mean, I remember one where uh, counsel came and said, this joint venture dispute is different from any other that you will have heard. So why? He said, most joint venture disputes are about joint ventures which have broken down and are unhappy. This is a case of a highly successful joint venture partnership where both parties are still happy, but they just disagree. So I think you got the frame of that straight away. Um, and, and then they, they had a disagreement about the distribution of the profits. It was more or less, it was construction. And we spent a few days on, on the, the, the witnesses, but really it was just interpretation of who should get what share of profits. Um, and in the end, it, it settled. But the, the story was coming out, and you, you, you sort of, get the flow of it. Uh, I mean, in, in fact, it was actually quite not a very interesting story because, you know, it was all in the agreement and what is meant by profits and what is meant by uh, deductions and what are the deductions that are allowed before you calculate the division of profits. But he made it like a human story and he told you about the, you know, the, how the venture developed some highly successful, prof uh, successful and profitable product and everybody was making money the only question was how much money should each party have. Um, so you can tell the story. I mean, and you can refer to the documents and humanize it and have the. Uh, ah, sorry, I, 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 I must tell you the story since you, you remind me. Uh, I, I told you we, we have a, a, a statutory uh, 
course of action in Singapore under our Companies Act, where um, a minority shareholder complains that he is being oppressed uh, or persecuted uh, or bullied by the majority shareholder. You probably have some equivalent under your company's law. And so you make a petition to the court. Now this one is where you don't have to have the witness cross-examined because you file this document and you simply say, well, uh, you know, the company was set up and so and so, these are the shareholders, and then Mr. Majority Shareholder has committed the following acts of oppression and you list out all these stories. Now that's a very interesting story. So I was counsel and I was standing up there and I was telling the story. So I had maybe seven, eight examples of oppression. So I start telling the story, uh, first uh, example, second example, third example. And you know, we stand up there in court and we wear the gown. And then suddenly I feel somebody tugging my gown and I look, it's my opponent. And he pushes this note under my nose and says, will you take one million to settle? <laughs> Carry on, number four, number five, number six, and he turns my gown again and says, will you take two million? And then you know, he goes on like this for a little while. I think by the time he got to five million, I said, uh, I asked for a postponement. <laughs> yeah, and German, and then we, we, we talk and, and we settle. And, and that is actually what the um, QCs of London used to do. They would take sometimes two days, three days, for a very complicated commercial case. And they could open their case for two or three days. And some people would settle just after hearing that opening statement. And I, I would, you know, that's my best. It doesn't happen to all the time, but that's why I remember this particular case that it was so devastating, you couldn't run away from me. I, don't, I didn't need my client to come and give everything because there was no answer. It was all on the documents. And as you, know, you, as, as you said it and you linked it together, then he, he realized how bad it was sounding for his client. He had no answer. So he was just trying to uh, mitigate um, the, the damage that uh, occurred for his client. Um, of course, some council, uh, the UK council, take this to real extremes. I mean, there have been famous cases where they've actually opened the case for one month. Two months, yes. Um, but uh, no, those, those, are those are very, very complicated cases. Something like uh, complicated trusts and tax avoidance schemes. That's really, really dull. That's really, really uh, very hard to... I mean, that, you really don't need witnesses. You just have to take them through all the documents and explain the connections and draw charts and so on. Uh, but you go with the average case, uh, you can break it down and just look at it. Do you really need to cross-examine? Because every time you put up yourself up to cross-examine, you are, are, as it were, telling the uh, tribunal, there's something wrong with this witness and I can show you why. At the end of it, if you don't show anything seriously wrong, then what is why did you take so much time and why did you not? It's almost a waste of time. We, it's time that could have been better spent doing something else. That's I think what I say. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a quick question. My name is Ari Arnesi from Timothy. And I was just curious for what you find helpful and not helpful in the use of demonstrative exhibits and PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentations. There's any, any pet peeves of yours or things like that? PowerPoint, I personally find less lasting in any effect. Uh, unless they are things like corporate charts uh, in a complicated uh, case where there are several companies uh, involved. That, that, that's when the PowerPoints uh, are useful. Um, but the ones which just have flashing uh, animations are uh, not terribly. <laughs> um, they don't have a lasting effect. Uh, it's, they still go back to the main. Uh, so because that, it, I, I, that is distracting in another way. Um, because I don't think there's lasting value. I mean, these are just because they're all text heavy, but um, most of the uh, law firms like to make it fancy. Uh, uh, like, almost like a film show. Other questions?
then I think that uh, this will conclude our lecture session. And uh, please join me uh, to give